cancel. Does anybody know? I, Never mind. Yeah, I think I just get one. Oh, good. I was hoping it understood. <laughs> but Chris, your your uh, kids were cool. Yeah, yeah, I think they liked it. Yeah. Was it little ninth grader from Okemos who got on? Uh, this is a uh, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers, I should say, since we just went live November 4th. And I was just talking to Chris Sloan about uh, some of his students who got on with some students from Okemos, Michigan, uh, Don Reed's students, and um, on Tuesday, and there was a ninth grader who we're asking the question there. I'm jumping right in here. Sorry, we'll introduce here in a second. But anyway, um, we're asking about fairness and what is fairness. And he said, "Can I talk about something other than school?" And he's like, "He's like, you know, those Palestinians and the people in Gaza. That's not fair." And it's like, he uh, had such a. He said, "This the Spanish American War. It all started then." So, like, oh my God, <laughs> this kid is. He was pretty amazing. But your kids were amazing, too. They're dealing with um, internment and, and so forth. Their topics... Yeah, um, generational incarceration is their, one of their themes. Great. So that's Chris Sloan. Um, and uh, I, I'm inviting everyone here right in the middle of a conversation, as you can kind of tell. Um, Chris Sloan from Salt Lake City. Do you want to introduce yourself a little more, Chris? Sure. Uh, my name's... Chris Sloan, and I uh, teach high school English and media, and um, so my students are currently um, starting their inquiries, and some of them are around, um, the couple in particular that we might touch on tonight, one is about um, the effect of our justice system on the youth in our community, especially issues of generational incarceration and, and what, uh, you know, prison to pipeline, or school to prison pipeline kinds of issues. And then another group is also um, looking at the effect of poverty on youth in our community. So those are two things that seem to me that strike me about uh, fairness. Great. Um, I'd love to hear more uh, as we go here. Al? Do you want to Al. say hello? <clears throat> hello, Al Elliott, fifth grade uh, language arts teacher, uh, Green Valley Elementary, Hoover, Alabama, um, and, and a fan of the show. <laughs> trying to convince Al to uh, to maybe produce a few shows with us, so that'll be fun. Al's writing a book, I understand, right? Yes, yes, I'm writing a book, um, 42, My Jackie Robinson Years. It's uh, basically like a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy to my son. It's like um, uh, it's like advice, but, but kind of, it's too much for one sitting, so I'm writing a book so he can kind of have an instruction manual to kind of make it through this, you know, so he can make some new mistakes. Like, here, son, here's how I know what doesn't work, right? So. Wow. So, yeah, maybe uh, we can jump in on some of that before it gets published, so that would be great. Definitely. Yeah, cool. Um, Gail, new to us, but welcome. Hi there. Um, I'm a retired kindergarten teacher from Western Mass and a friend of Kevin Hodgson's, who's a regular on the broadcast. Um, Not regular enough, by the <laughs> way. But, <laughs> but yeah, welcome. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, he's regular everywhere. But go ahead. <laughs> he's a very busy guy. That's yeah. fair. So um, I see invitations coming through, and nine o'clock is a little late for me. Actually, but what can I say? I'm in Eastern U.S. and I'm getting older. But um, the topic when it came through today was something that it's it's hurtful to me when I think of the lack of fairness and 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 the idea of some restorative practices and restorative justice. Sounds like we're seeking answers to a very complex problem and having the necessary combinate conversations. So I'm really interested in digging into this a little bit. I also come from a kindergarten background, so my perspective is how we build, how we maintain the wonderful social we have over all those years and, and can raise kids to a place where the pipeline will not be spitting out so many uh, kids into prison. Thank you for that introduction. Super. Sean. Welcome. 
Uh, Sean McComb, I teach students uh, English at 10th grade level at uh, Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts, which is just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, uh, in the Dundalk community. And uh, excited to talk about this uh, topic a little bit more in a, a conversation uh, and not uh, in what I've been seeing on social media alone. So happy to have a, a deeper conversation about it. Yeah, you know, I I think it's a, well, I always wonder if we're just jumping on to a bandwagon when we talk about this stuff, but I think the way we talk about it and so forth is makes it different in some way. And you just did a, it was a TED Talk Live, is that right? Here in New yeah. York City. And what was your, your topic is similar to, was it was it kindness or? Uh, yeah, so is a eight minute, uh, TED Talk, and uh, I would say like the underlying principle was uh, to have a an ethic of care in our schools and the value of that. And um, and I you know when I when I see an incident like Spring Valley uh, or think about what must have uh, preempted that um, uh, before the video, you know, what happens before the video to get to that point, um, you know, I, that, that's the question that comes to my mind uh, first about relationships between students and teachers, uh, the culture of the school, um, you know, th there's, there's no absolutes, not like uh, great care can prevent every incident from happening, but, um, but I just think that in all the talk that we that I've heard about education reform, that we can't lose uh, that that baseline of of care. And so I talked about that for a while. Yeah, and you were asked to talk about the revolution in education, right? Is that what I understood? Yeah. And you yeah. ended up talking about care. How that's sort of did people say that's a soft topic to you, or or how did uh, you deal with it? <laughs> well, they they let me they let that be the topic, uh, okay. but in some ways I think. That topic is is almost in the reform conversation revolutionary. Um, I I think you know we want to talk about a revolution in education. We talk about hardware and data reports, and that hearts and relationships are I think what pr should preempt all of those things. The basic humanity and human relationship of schooling, and um, and and I just think that we we simply make assumptions about that and. Uh, I think if you talk to students, they would say uh, that that's often missing. And then I think if we all think about the teachers who probably made the biggest impact in our lives, I, I think one of the first words that we would choose to describe them would be care. And there's been some surveys like, you know, Gallup asked this question in one of their surveys, and the number one word used to describe the best teacher that people had ever had was the first word that came to mind was care. And I'm not, you know, I don't think that's surprising, but I think that it's hard to do on a daily basis. It's hard to do when we're stressed out and we have so many different pressures pulling at us. And so I think that it is, uh, you know, in my book, maybe revolutionary to put it back at the top of the list uh, and to say that this needs to be where we start and then we can have other conversations. Great. And just to say, you uh, just, I think, this week or end of last week got a bunch of your students on to Youth Voices, and so they will be joining us, we hope, in different ways, and maybe they'll be joining us on Youth Voices Live, too, if we can get the timing right um, yeah. in some way. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll figure that out. Yeah. Um, but uh, and the only other introductory thing I want to say here is that we are experimenting with this large question of what does fairness mean to you, um, it's uh, and you can see more about what we're talking about at youthvoices.net/fairness. And um, I did finally get a hold of the uh, the people who were doing uh, the ask big questions last year, and they're not going to be producing more more uh, content. They're focusing you know on other kinds of ways of building conversations on college campuses and so forth. Um, so they were really happy to hear your suggestion, Chris Sloan, <laughs> that let's come up with our own topic. And at some point, somebody has to make a decision, and I made it. I'll admit that. Um, and but but just thinking about what your students are doing, Chris, but also looking at what uh, Joe Pariso's students are doing in um, 
in Oakland. And Sean, do you do you want to talk a little bit about what your students are or some of their topics as well because they're similar? Yeah. So uh, so my students uh, are. Uh, pursuing inquiry questions around the kind of big umbrellas of um, criminal justice reform, uh, the refugee crisis, um, civil rights and race issues, and civil rights and um, LGBT issues. Um, each student, you know, has has selected one of those categories and then their own topic, kind of subtopic within there. Um, on Tuesday of next week, they start. They're doing some Skype interviews of people who are doing this work, which I'm pretty excited about. And uh, they're all drafting their first process blogs. Um, some started today, and others will will continue on Friday. So, uh, are they recording those Skype interviews? Yeah. So that's the that's the plan. Okay. Yep. Great. So th that would be shareable on Youth Voices. That'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. if we mm -hmm. Do that. Yeah. Record. Okay. All right. So. There's all that going around, and then there was this video in um, South Carolina, uh, as you identified, the Spring Valley High School video. Um, this, uh, let's start there, and then, but let's broaden out back into our fairness and other kinds of issues. Um, Al, can I call on you to describe what happened? <laughs> Just um, briefly, yeah. Because we're not going to show the video again. But okay. We well, want to have it um, on our minds, yeah. Well, the video, I guess, the, the video picks up with um, a female student sitting in a desk in her class. Um, and and I've heard of the video that she was either on her phone or wouldn't get off her phone. But she had been asked wouldn't give it up, maybe. Yeah. Or wouldn't give it up or was on it. Um, but in the video, she's just seen sitting there. Um and because I, I, there is no sound that I could hear. I've never heard, seen the video with sound. Um, and when um, then a police officer comes in, um, and when the police officer comes in, uh, he, 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 he grabs her and flips her over in the desk, and then he grabs her and drags her and throws her or slings her kind of, like, I guess, six feet across the floor, um, and then I guess, you know, continues to remove her. But that's kind of where the video stops. So that's kind of the part of the video that's kind of become, you know, repeatedly well, played. But but she was she was um she was unresponsive to re requests of hers to leave uh, the classroom several times. That's my understanding prior to this video. But the video shows the police officer coming in, grabbing her, flipping her over out of the desk, and then with the desk still kind of she's still in the desk when all of this happens. And then she's kind of slung across the floor, and I think that's when she parts ways with the desk, getting towards the door. And all the, and the classroom is full of other students. These students are sitting in their desk. They're not up doing anything, but just sitting at the desk. There's a teacher in the room at the time when this happens, and everyone else remains seated until the police officer removes uh, the young lady from the class. It may be a quibbling point, but uh, worth noting, I think he's, he's, he wasn't actually a police officer, right? I mean, he's a security officer in the school. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I don't know if it's worth... I mean, do you, do you, does it matter to Is you, it, Al, which, which... Well, I don't... It looks like an officer. I don't know right. where mm -hmm. his certification comes from. I'm saying police officer... There's a uniform gentleman <laughs> that enters <laughs> okay. into the class domain. I'm not exactly sure if it's ranking or, you know, if this is, the, you know, Richland County Sheriff's Office or what. I don't. I'm not sure who who it is. No. Yeah, he doesn't report to schools. That's 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 clear. right. Yeah. Yeah. It it is someone who thought they had the authority to do what it was they did. So no one stopped him. He was in. Invited in to complete a task by the teacher. Yeah. He thought he was by the teacher by request, mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought I, I think that he was um, diligent in fulfilling his duties to him. The opposite of caring, I would say, though. For, fair enough. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, well, you know what? So. I'll, I, I, I was just supposed to describe the video. I mean, are we go for it now. In? I just thought you get get us going here a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, just overall, to me, the video is disturbing for several reasons. Um, 
But one of the things that's disturbing about the video is the context at which the video is discussed. Um, because like when I hear about the video, most of the time it's followed up by the word investigation, which is just weird, you know, because we because we're looking at the video, right? And it's kind of like, you know, I don't I don't I don't know what we're investigating now. Presumably. Because we see what the police officer does, and noted, I had to take like what's called a takedown training um, at the elementary school. So I've had some, I've had some training in how to physically restrain students coming at you with scissors and whatnot. Um, and so the training that I had, I am not comparing to whoever it was featured in the video, but the techniques that they shared with us seem to be more caring than what I saw. <laughs> Right, and so I'm in my mind. I'm thinking he at least have, has had as much training as I have had in physically removing a child from a classroom. Um, so, so can I jump in on that? Because because yeah. I think that's complicated. Like, have I ever wanted a kid removed from my classroom? You bet. You know, I mean, <laughs> there. Um, so, like, I think a teacher kind of gets. I don't know. I, I'll I mean, but, speak for myself. But, I get, but, but I get, point, I get the frustration, right? Yeah, yeah. But the only yeah. point, though, is the investigation is about what could have caused, like what what could have made what we saw on the tape acceptable. To me, is what the conversation is. When I hear the investigation, it it is always around what happened before the video, as if there is. Uh, a, a series of epiphanies that could unfoil where we would say, oh, well, that's why you turn people over in the... I, I can see now. I didn't know they were going to unturn that stone. Like, it's weird to hear the term investigation, you know, spoken of to me. Now, that's kind of overall the most disturbing part of... Like, when I hear people talk about it, and they talk about investigating, it's never about what they saw. Mm -hmm. So... I, Al, I want to interrupt you and, and let Gail know that we interrupt each other on this show, so please interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. We can't we can't see you raise a hand or anything either, so please, please let us know. Um, well, I, when you, I am ready. Go ahead, not go ahead jump in. Yeah, but I am good. looking for, Al's brought up some good points. My training was in de-escalation rather than restraint training. Huh. That was a different training that was offered. Another one of those things, teachers are supposed to voluntarily sign up to get uh, and not get compensated for, but you're supposed to, just to, out of the goodness of your heart, be willing to take on these situations. But from what I understand, situations like that are only supposed to happen if there is a genuine threat to self or others. Mm -hmm. And that was not a situation where someone needed to be taken down by a room with a room full of frightened students, anxious educator, administration was standing in the doorway, I believe, and they were not responding what I would think was appropriately. You evacuate the class, you get the child out of the embarrassment of all eyes on them that's increasing and escalating their emotions and escalating the stubbornness, but just getting away from all of that as Al was saying about the investigation angle, the investigation has to go into every player in that room. And how did, th what did they learn that day? What did that child taking the video learn? What did the child who refused to look to that side of the room learn? How are they facing their day-to-day -day struggles in that classroom right now? And that says there's this huge lapse of communication, understanding there is no recourse for students. So what if the kid's going to be a, a big handful? The fact is you can't get physical with a minor like that when there isn't a threat to self or others. So that was my interruption. <laughs> yeah, so so you're saying there's a, the responsibility in you Wow, I never thought I did wonder about that kid who who doesn't even look up from his desk, right? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, like is is that you know a bystander, you know? Uh, but what could that kid have done? I don't know. Well, I mean, but then it's it's codified behavior. I mean, like 
you know, I know how to behave when a police officer is working. Just like from being around police officers working. And they don't take too kindly to, to you, you know, being sort of hands on and judgmental. Well the so, girl the girl who did took the video got arrested and was right. out of bail, yeah. So but, yeah. yeah. So I'd like I'll jump in um and say a couple things. So uh so yeah, I you know so so one I I I'm stuck on why does having a phone out require the student to leave the room at ever? I mean, is the is the phone in itself a, a distraction to other students learning? Why why can't the student be dealt with after class? Why can't this issue be dealt with after class? I think you know, I think it's incumbent on the teacher to, to keep learning happening for the other students, and you do that by not escalating the situation, I think, as, uh, as Gail brought up. Um, so really, you know, I, th I think about, what is this about? Is this a, did, the, did the teacher create a power struggle for themselves in the room? And then did, the, did this start from a teacher uh, being concerned about saving their own face or saving their, saving their own sense of, of authority within a classroom when, a stu when they, you know, created this situation of defiance. If the rule is that a student shouldn't have a phone out in the classroom, then you know you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation on the side. If the student doesn't put it away, I think we can move on from there. But you know, I think this would be an interesting other piece for uh, Chris's media students to look at. But since this video has uh, been on my news feeds, another video has suddenly appeared of a Chicago classroom uh, with a substitute teacher in it and some, a, a student holding a desk over this substitute teacher and threatening her. And this video, which is suddenly, you know, a very curious timing, becoming very popular, um, is from 2011. But, but now, in 2015, this other video, as a, a, almost a counter-narrative, is suddenly being shared. I, I think it's very interesting grounds for uh, some media literacy or media study to look at at how that piece is coming up. But you know, so those are two thoughts, I think. You know, how did we get to a place where there's such a power struggle that, a, that an administrator or a police officer needs to be called to the room to remove a student who, from my understanding, was not, what had a phone out, which to me is not a disturbance worthy of leaving learning and leaving a classroom necessarily. If it's mm -hmm. first time or whatever. And then the, the, the last point is, um, you know, I think, I think context matters, and uh, from what I read, a statement from the girl's uh, lawyer, she is re recently orphaned and recently uh, put into a foster home, and so, you know, and and so I think this was a new school for her, and so maybe the the teachers weren't aware of this context entirely. But I think we also need to think about, you know, do we do we ask some t basic questions of uh, of new entrants uh, for for context, and maybe there's more to think about with what's shared and not. But um, you know, let's let's think a little bit of what this 16 year old is going through, having just lost her mother and grandmother and gone into the foster care system, uh, and then this happens to her. So lot there's a lot of pieces swirling here. Chris Sloan, do you want to jump in? Well, or? I mean, one thing that, and I haven't watched the video a lot. I watched it maybe twice. Um, That's enough. <laughs> to me, um, like I was, uh, I noted how passive the rest of the class was. Like, I think if that happened in my, you know, well, it wouldn't happen in my classroom, but, you know, if it happened in my culture and in my school, I think people would, like, you'd see people um, uh, jerk around a little bit or, you know, like be shocked or something. But to me, like, when I looked at it, it seemed like maybe everybody's just scared out of their wits. But even so, like, sometimes people will uh, jump or get out of the way or whatever, but uh, I was just struck by everybody's pretty passive in that situation. So I wonder, you know, also about the culture of the school and whether that's a real common thing. But I think ultimately, um, just kind of to that point, um, whoever the resource officer, and again, this is, this is hearsay, Your Honor, um, but I think that he has a relationship and has a reputation at the school being the person that can remove difficult students, right? Mm -hmm. like he is effective at that. And so he was specifically called in to remove a difficult student. 
But when you mention the reaction to everybody in the class, I think it's important to not separate separate this moment in time with the history and the culture that exists, period. You know, like, there hasn't been a time in this country, you know, where the relationships between police officers and black people haven't been, let's say, tense. So I think it's a codified behavior, you know. Can you, there, there, can there you break of, down codified? Okay, so... There are certain ways, okay, so the, the simplest way to explain code switching is I can be on the telephone talking to somebody, and then when I get to work, the way that I speak to the people that, oh, hey, good morning, hey, how are you doing? It's different. Yeah, I get how to that. Talking with to language, phone. I get it. So, yeah, yeah. so with language it is, so behavior is the same. So there are certain ways that I behave when blue lights go on behind me. Or there's certain ways that I, I behave differently if I see police officers around me or if a police officer is, is engaged there's there's a certain way that you act in certain situations and so th those students obviously it was almost like a drill right like you know what to do in this situation because you have either been in a situation like this or you've been told how to react in a situation like this and you know and so a survival technique for uh, people of color is to become docile right like I you know, uh, people of color in this country, black people are descendants of the survivors. So because the survivors went through a process called slavery, um, the docile slaves had a greater likelihood of surviving. There wasn't a lot of back-talking slaves made it to procreate. You know, they were castrating people back then. <laughs> so you see what I mean? And so there is a, there, there is a, um, a, a genetic, you know, um, epigenetic uh, um, what is it an epigenetic effect you know epimenon on top of like where physically what is happening to a people can be transferred you know at, to descendants and so there are characteristics of people where when police officers come in or whatever because of how your parents have been raised because of your experiences in your community so when this happens in the classroom you know that becomes the normal so it's okay then that because what flashed in my head as soon as I saw the video was the one in Florida with the cop with the you know the swimsuit girl in the swimsuit you know with his knee in her back, and then all the other videos you know from you know Michael Brown through the past whatever eighteen it's longer than that now eighteen months or so the um. Is that fair? I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't as serious a, a, a matter, but what you're saying would suggest it is fair that, that even though it was a less serious offense in some way, um, you know, she, he he didn't kill her. Um, I'm saying it reminded us of other things. Right, right, but like, okay, okay. So right now we're having a conversation about the behavior of everybody else in the room. Right, and which I I think is a conditioned response, right? But I think the consistent genetic defect is a, the disease, you know, of violence, <laughs> of 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 a of an organization of individuals, right? Like historically, to certain groups of people, like that is you know, that happens. Like that's. There are multiple videos, there are multiple accounts, and even before there were videos, there were multiple stories, right? Like if you start to look, uh, start looking at movies from the 80s and the 70s, right? And even before you had videos, the, the, the inside joke was how violent police officers were to black people, as if black people that already knew what was going on. I mean, look at all episodes of Fred Sanford, or Good Times, or uh, any show, any movie, from that era of time, that's a consistent thing, you know. And so I don't, I don't think it's as much as a new phenomenon as we just have, you know. The, the revolution is being televised, so to speak. Like we just think, get to see it more often. I think it was interesting to watch Jimmy Carter on the elders video talking about growing up and having friends mm -hmm. of of color, uh, and that that moment that came in his poem when he spoke of the time that his friends stepped back and let him go first and 
he just thought there was some kind of a trick they were going to play on him or That's something. That's really interesting. Yeah, that was coded behavior, too. And it yeah. was. Back then, the, the parents had been, of the survivors, as Al was saying, had been mm. helping their kids to be survivors in some way. And uh, there must have been a little hopelessness in being able to make effective change to that so that they could all just scramble over that gate on their, you know, whoever got there first. So if, if you're not aware of what Gail's referring to, and thank you for pointing that one out, that one was striking to me too. Um, so the elders have put together these uh, very short videos. They're like a minute and a half long or so, um, uh, answering the question with an object. Like, here's an object that represents fairness to me. Um, and Jimmy Carter's is, is, is quite remarkable in his understanding of race relations. And what I loved in that was the way he said, we're still friends. Um, it, was, it was really interesting. But so understanding the difference, but also seeing the hope in that poem was really interesting. I thought. Mm. And so one way you can find it is going to youthvoices.net slash fairness. But then you have to kind of look around a little bit and find find the, the videos um, that there, there is a link to all of their videos there. Um, but that would be one thing our kids could do, by the way. They, I think would be really interesting is to find an object that represents fairness to them. And, and if you don't mind, I don't want to spend all of our time here on that video because that's not kind of what we're about in some way. I, I want to kind of get to, I mean, we've, I put this out there as being about restorative justice, right? Restorative practices. Um, we talk about that in my school, um, and it's hard to see it happening, or if I could say it that way. It's, it's, it's hard um, because of, again, sorry to harp on the word coded, but like the, the kinds of behaviors that we as teachers and administrators and disciplinary people have and the expectations young people have, it's hard to break through all of that and to think about other kinds of practices that would be good for the community. Does somebody want to take a stab at what restorative justice is, what restorative practices are? Not that you guys are experts necessarily, but... Well, I mean, um, yeah. I think like just like a general working definition of mm -hmm. justice could kind of help God, you know, like if you're going to apply this definition to education, to whatever. And so I think, um, I heard a guy's name is Neely Fuller. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, but he kind of defined, I'm paraphrasing, but he defined, he came up with his own definition of justice in his attempts to replace it as the system that runs the world. And he, so he says, uh, justice is, and he said, it's never happened. He said, this has never existed. So this is a goal or something to work towards. But he says justice is is when you know no one is mistreated, and the person that needs the most help gets the most constructive help. So in every situation, if you're dealing with a child in the classroom, well, first of all, as a teacher, whatever I'm going to do, it should not be able to be classified as mistreatment under any adult logical rubric. And whoever needs the most help, if so if the person that needs the most help does not need help with multiplication <laughs> then justice says I need to take care of who needs the most help in this situation and kinda let that work its way through whatever it means right but to having that good definition of what justice is it becomes applicable I thought it was like a, mm -hmm. a, a different way to look at it and Chris, you, you put in the chat there a, a post by your student about justice. Do you want to speak to that a little bit or or anything? Uh, sure. So, um, and I'll put it in the um, chat in the... Ed, Ed Tech Talk. Yeah. Ed Tech okay. Talk, too. So um, they are, um, you know, to contextualize this, um, we're, um, we work with PBS NewsHour. We're a student reporting labs. And... Um, they have um, what they call signature series where they'll have uh, students from around the country kind of do a take on some issue. And uh, one of the things these uh, my students picked up on is, is the idea of, um, you know, justice and its effect on our community. 
and uh, the youth in our community. And so, you know, I thought it was interesting, the opening line there uh, of the post, because, like, a lot of people would say, well, Utah, you know, it's pretty tame and everything. Um, but the opening sentence, although the overall crime rate in Utah fell in the past two decades, the state's prison population grew by 18%, six times faster than the national average. Um, and that was in a Pew report, I think. Um, I don't know if that was cited there, but um, that comes from a, a Pew um, survey. So um, I'm putting it on then, the screen, by the way. But go ahead, yeah. Yeah, and then we've got a uh, a teacher at our school who uh, also teaches at the Metro Jail, and so they talked to the teacher, and the teacher said, "Well, actually, you should talk to my supervisor, who's the education coordinator at the jail." And and you know they had an interesting interview with the uh, education coordinator at the jail because she said actually um, she thinks things are actually on the up. Um, she says there's like a new um, outpatient facility being built. Um, they're trying to focus people or funnel people more into like you know mental treating mental illness and addiction stuff rather than just throwing people in jail. So from her, and there's a new women's unit too that she was really excited about because she's teaching now at the new women's unit. So she was just saying that even though, you know, things have been bleak from her perspective, and this is the education coordinator at the jail, um, thinks that maybe things, because of these alternative programs, like maybe there'll be some positive changes in our community. Mm -hmm. And so that's where they are right now, um, and they're going to talk to some more people. Quick geeky thing, just to say, I noticed that I think I probably added the hypothesis link to the link that your student had there. Uh -huh. So we can we can annotate that together. But now there is actually a group. Um, it was just announced today. Jeremy Dean let us know by email. So we can have youth a youth voices group where we can find each other. Um, okay. So there is some hope of making connections around that. Um, but yeah, I, and, and there were just, what, 6,000 people released from jail too. Um, I just, from, from a, something Obama did. And I, so what? how did your students respond to her saying things are on the up? Well, I mean, they want to talk to other people and get some other perspectives because, you know, that's one person. Mm -hmm. So they are um, trying to get, um, you know, we're going to, we've arranged to take a tour of the jail and then talk to um, another um, person there and we're um, the, the information person at the jail. Um, but again, um, they're also trying to find, this is pretty, I mean, it's private, kind of information and not easy to get. They're trying to find someone who's kind of successfully navigated the the justice education system and is, um, you know, trying to get things back together. And that's pretty slippery because it's not always easy to find that story mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Um, so right now they're just trying. I, I I probably need to do this research, but one of your students might want to do it. There there is a a person who um, Latino USA they always connect with, and he runs a, an education program for um, and and a program where they collect money from the other prisoners um, for uh, second generation offenders. Um, so definitely exactly what some of your kids are looking at. So we need to make some of those connections um, if we can. But is it a, a stretch? I mean, some of your students who were on Youth Voices Live on Tuesday, or a couple of your students who are looking into this, they were fine making the connection between school to prison pipeline. Um, around discipline issues and the video that they had seen and, and their work with incarceration. But is that, do you think, is it, to, I guess I'll just say, I, it feels like too big of a stretch sometimes to me. Like, we're talking about discipline kids, discipline kids in school. But. But I think you really can't ignore where the discipline problems in schools come from. 
right? Like it almost always goes back to this idea of generational poverty, right? So, you know, if you look at schools that are considered to be successful, most of the time they are not dealing with the, you know, the environmental issues that unsuccessful schools are dealing with, by and large. You know, just lower instances of poverty. So, you know, it's, it's like schools try to figure out better ways to teach impoverished kids instead of, <laughs> you know, getting rid of the instances of poverty in the community. And so then you kind of have to start to look at, well, what is a school supposed to do, right? And then you look at a school on an individual basis. And sometimes the rubric, right, you, you've got a, a high school full of young adults living in a city full of problems. None of these young minds are trying to solve the problem. All of these young minds are trying to get their ACT scores up. Like at some point, somebody needs to square the circle and say, hey, let's put some of these young minds to work on something. They are genuinely emotionally attached to the environment that they live in. All of the kids don't like that environment, right? And, and literally let that be part of the curriculum, you know, some of the curriculum, because what ends up happening is, we, 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 we let a few of the kids navigate out to the other side, and somehow that is the success story. Like, the idea is always, how can I get out, right? And so when the few that can get out get out, the ones that cannot get out, it is more difficult for them to get out because their best has now left, you know? And it's kind of a, um, that's what's making the problem. Right? The reason you had these discipline problems is because those kids know what they're up against. They can read. They can look at the news. They are competing against kids that could have already passed these t standardized tests in the 10th grade and the 9th grade and have the scholarships and have jobs waiting for them. And now, I'm, now you're telling me to struggle as hard as I can, work as hard as I can, barely eat by and get this degree, and then go out and compete for, you know, where these jobs are not. Like, you know what I mean? And and, and and a lot of the kids sniff out the fool's gold before they get student loans, I think. You know? So, Can you know, I, how you square that circle? Is that what you said earlier? We need somebody to square the circle? Right. That phrase. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, Joe's class is, a, her work is a pretty good example of what Al was talking about in the beginning about, you know, um, having her students take on the problems in her community and then, um, you know, try to write to the people or contact the people who make the decisions. And, you know, I think I wish she were here to talk about it, but, you know, like that strikes me as the kind of thing Al was talking about. Mm -hmm. And when we can connect on uh, Youth Voices Live, I think it's, it is good for the, the people around the country um, to talk about those issues with each other? Well, I mean, and what, what's fascinating, by the way, and Gail, I see you get going. Let me, let me just say quickly that, that what's fascinating is that Joe's kids are from Oakland are different than my kids from the Bronx are different from the kids up in Okemos, but like the kids up in Okemos, Michigan, they're like, you have, you have guards in your school? What's that about, right? Um, and so, so People are starting to think, you know, not all schools are exactly the same when they when they see that kind of thing. But then, when we asked your students, Chris, what happens when a student really messes up at your school? Um, they say it doesn't happen very often, but then expulsion happens, and and we said, well, do you ever see that student again? They said no, <laughs> but they said it doesn't happen very often. So, and that's not something that ha you know, in a public school that doesn't happen as much. So, yeah. We need to be talking about this stuff, and kids need to see differences. Yeah, I think you know, it it's meaning. Ahead. It has to be meaningful for the students, and with uh, school reform pushing through more and more test-focused uh, initiatives, how to improve scores, we're getting farther away from the ideas of project-based learning where kids could tackle real-world issues in their own small personal space and and have success, be successful, feel positive, feel like they can contribute a voice and action 
sort of remedy for something, building community along the way and building those connections with your peers is so important, mm. but um, we are pushing for the test scores instead. I posted in the chat a picture of the buddy bench. Well, that's something an elementary school has, and it's that, a child. That's the Google Drive post that you did? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's from my it's not, school. It's not shared with the uh, uh, public, okay. so you, but okay. go ahead, just to, just to say, but yeah, go Nothing ahead. Is, the buddy bench, tell us about it. Yeah. The buddy bench is a place where if you are without a friend, you can go sit there, and it's known that that's a spot that you can go and others will seek you out. If someone sees someone sitting there, plenty of people will come over and say, hey, come play with me, and it's some way of reaching out. Well, that's nice for little kids. What can we do that's not a buddy bench but has the same supportive idea that we can do for older kids? That girl sitting in that video who maybe had lost her parents, maybe she needed somebody. It could have been a trusting adult if she had one. She was probably silent with the people who needed to hear what she had to say. But if she had a buddy, somebody who was going to be her ally, and could speak up for her. Um, how can we build and restore to justice environments where children are available and free to learn safely and feel, first of all, that they are going to be respected and listened to? Yeah, I'll, so I'll jump in here and, and say I think you know one program that I admire at the secondary level, and I, I know you guys had the the guys from Science Leadership on a few weeks ago, and you know a hallmark of their school is the advisory program. So um, there's a, a teacher loops with students for four years, and I think once a week for maybe a half hour, uh, they they have time together with those you know about a dozen students or so. So uh, in that case, you have a cohort of students who get to know their teacher a teacher really well, but also get to know one another very well, and kind of uh, you can have that tie-in and that relationship there uh, across a high school experience, which I think is really powerful. Um, I spent eight years teaching in an AVID program, which uh, meant is a college readiness program that meant that I looped with a cohort of students for four years in a kind of academic coaching role. And, um, and I, I can't tell you how many of those kids had each other when, uh, when times got tough, and they had me, and we had that, that safe place. Um, and you know, I think I think it's worth investing that time. The teacher, um, you know, as as you know, maybe the secondary equivalent of a of a buddy bench. That really does make a huge difference, doesn't it? It's having maybe an adult who's over there overseeing everything, but it's those personal connections with their peers and knowing that even if there aren't problem solvers, there's somebody there to listen and sympathize in, in a different way. And Chris, you get to see your students, I, I don't know, it's not by accident, right? But you see your students for a long time, it seems. Uh, yeah, so I have a media class and photography classes um, where I'll see them sometimes like all four years, like I'll have a ninth through 12th grade. A lot of times 10th through 12th, and then I'll have them again like in my English class. So some of them I see quite a bit uh, through the years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that is, like Sean said, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Uh, De Sean, Sean mentioned Zach Chase and Chris Lehman, and, and in their book, they, they have a really powerful metaphor of, and maybe others use it too, but uh, to not get concerned about the seat being in the upright position. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, so that you, you, the, the plane can probably land if you don't have the seat in the upright position, right? Um, and I think that's a really interesting metaphor, right? For this girl could have held on to her her cell phone and the plane would have landed. Right? So, but but you know we have we we get really concerned about these trivial things that you know we just do over and over again because it's the right way to do it, I suppose. So yeah. Sean, were you leaning in or no? Okay, fair enough. He said no. Uh, so, so okay. So let me bring up the the differences between fairness, justice, 
um, that, that kind of language. Um, when we ask students to think about, and this again, just, just yesterday, um, the, so a couple of students from Okemos again, um, one, one, one young woman in particular mentioned a drawing, and I've seen it too, of um, two, two people uh, looking over a fence, and they could, they could both, you know, they were both at equal level, but then when you pulled back, you saw one had a higher ladder than the others did so that they could have equal opportunity, but, you know, it, it wasn't equal behind the fence. So that that student kind of got what fairness was and, and how it's different than equality was really, really interesting, and I think we'd, we'd love to see more of that attitude. Worth mentioning again, youthvoices.net slash fairness. There is a story that Zach, Zach Chase and Chris Lehman tell about a situation that could have gone really badly, but because the school was dealing with the student, you know, the student left the classroom, she wasn't punished, she, you know, there was a... There was a kind of there was a lot of conversation, a lot of uh, people getting involved. So I put that up there as a kind of antidote to the to the video, like here's how it could look. Um, and then there's the the third piece that's up there, and it's all annotatable in in now comment by the way. Um, the third piece up there is is a piece from Rethinking Schools that asks the question, you know, these circles and restorative justice are great, but like Yao was pointing out, if we're still pushing toward testing and we're not funding schools and everything, what does it really mean? Um, so those are the kinds of things that I was hoping that we could kind of launch with other students and, and be thinking about during those those Youth Voices live conversations, in addition to talking about their own individual inquiries that we mentioned. Any response to all of that? And Gail, you should talk a little bit about your passion for moving, like what can we learn from kindergarten and how can we hold on to it more? You mentioned that at the beginning. Oh, that, that's a great point, Paul, because in kindergarten, not as much as in the past, unfortunately, the focus had always been on social and language development. You bring social and language into those high school classrooms and spend time developing that, having conversations with each other and learning how to get along socially. Unfortunately, we've pulled back on that in kindergarten and it's become much more academic. So while the teachers know that's a priority, we squeeze it in, but we're usually cheating something else out of the curriculum. So the importance of that is building that community, particularly in the first six weeks of class. If you can create a safe environment for kids to come in and learn where they feel they've got friends and if they aren't their good friends, they know that they will be treated fairly and that the adults can be trusted to keep them safe in, in many ways, physically but emotionally more than anything else. We'll bring that up through the years. We start having more kids sitting in seats, kids listening for longer periods, kids having more challenges in focusing on what they have to do in school because as is the case in so many children's lives there's distractions real distractions from what the teacher thinks is important to share that day if I was thinking that my parents had died I was in a foster home that mom was mad at me this morning before I, I left home that's taking away from all of the learning and as Al was saying, it's the poverty that's at the foundation of it all. In our school, we would have plenty of wealthy families. We also had some low-income kids with, uh, with broken families living with grandparents, and there was a big difference between their, their lives. They had The poorer kids invariably needed more help and more services. And um, they were lacking so many of the foundation pieces, and the most important being the adult that was there to listen to them when they went home each day and, mm. and really cared about them. So in kindergarten, we take kids in their innocence, but when they get older, I think we get away from that. We're expecting more responsible behavior from them. We're expecting more adult behavior when how many kids are... Um, behind in their development or have delayed development in their social emotional lives 
So um, I can see these kids who have really struggled, have not been listened to, don't feel they're understood by their parents because they're teenagers anyway, but then we have some bigger tragedies when they become loners and they feel like they're outsiders. Mm -hmm. So I think the social-emotional development has to be part of our curriculum without, um, without any discussion about it. It has to be there. And unfortunately, we don't have that time. Yeah, I'm kind of struck by the continuum of that. Like Al is a fifth grade teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and Paul's middle school. I'm wondering how you... How that resonates with you all because that's she's talking about kindergarten. Is that? Still I was going to ask. Yeah, I, related. I was going to ask Al. Like, do your kids leave your school after you, or where do they? Or yes, they, yes, yes. No, so I how fifth, do you get them ready? Fifth, fifth grade is, is the highest grade, but like to my understanding, fairness begins uh, when when people recognize they have a voice. And young people figure out very quickly the strength of their voice or the lack of power of their voice, meaning that, okay, a child is interpreting the world. They, the children we get now are children of the world. They don't grow up in this cocoon. So they've already developed a sense of fairness before they walk into the door. Okay, so we either reaffirm what they've already discovered or we try to reestablish a new norm. But they have a sense of fairness, meaning that if they know that if their voice is never heard and never considered, most of the time when a, a student has a conflict, they feel like it's unfair only because they hadn't been listened to. Like, that's the beginning. She wouldn't listen to me. They, didn't, they took the other side. They just hadn't even been listened to, but that's where fairness begins. But even after you have that voice, if you actually see that my voice, it makes no difference, right? Like, you learn that lesson, too. And so a, a lot of times, Kids will tell you what's the matter. Like, kids will tell you what's wrong. Like, you will have to make them stop telling you what's wrong. But if they instantly see that, that when they tell somebody what's wrong or what's the matter and no help comes, eventually they learn to not call the cavalry. There is no cavalry. And this, you know, perception is reality. So however those kids perceive the world becomes their reality. And if they figure out that nobody's listening to them, then they pretty quickly figure out, I need to say that energy for something else, right? And so that's what I think happens. And I would say, you know, I, I work with young people who were held back or prevented from growing, <laughs> moving on to the next grades and so forth, um, after, you know, right, right in your grade, um, in fifth grade usually, but sometimes sooner. Um, and by the time they come to me, they've you know they haven't been listened to. They've uh, they've got so they they don't expect to be listened to, and it's it takes time for them to learn to trust. Um, an issue of poverty that I wanted to mention, just to, to make it really kind of concrete, it happened today. I have a toothache, right? And I was holding my cheek like this, and a kid said to me, "You know what? It looks like your tooth hurts." And I'm like, "How did he know?" Like I was just holding my face, right? <laughs> and he says, "Yeah, mine does too." Right, so uh, we have kids who are in school with their their teeth are like you know their teeth hurt, <laughs> and right. and it's tough to learn in, when your teeth hurt. <laughs> it is. I just, I just thought I'd put that kind of concrete story in there. It is that you know what these these kids come to us with with a lot of hurts that are unaddressed. Mm -hmm. You know the physical ones, the mental ones, the emotional ones. And, you know, and, and, and they don't have a voice. So one of the things I like to do is make sure that the kids know that they have a voice in the room. And that's kind of how I establish it. So I know, like, every Thursday we have Unplug and Ponder where, you know, we turn off the technology and have to think about a deep question. And we sit here and in the whole class period we just discuss what they think is important. Very, very poetic point. Like, one of the questions was, is it possible for a healthy brain to not have an imagination? And it was weird because they had to define imagination. One of the students defined imagination as the sparks for uh, invention. And so another student extrapolated on that and said that he thought that was the purpose of school, to collect sparks for the fires we want to have burning later on in life. Nice. That's why every Thursday we have to unplug the computers because a lot of times they need to know that the ideas they have right now are good. 
Like some of them have good ideas right now and they never get a chance to share it. But if they get a chance to share it, not only will they want to come up with another good idea, they've just inspired everybody else in the room to think of one. And I think if you don't give kids that voice, then they quickly reaffirm the idea that they have nothing important to share. And I have to remind my students that the adults have created the world you're inheriting. So we need help. Start thinking now. Good. Don't wait to grow up. We should wrap up here. Al, this is the opposite of turning all the computers off. But <laughs> Is there any chance you could uh, join us on, uh, like on a hangout from your school? With sure. Class? Sure. So we do it. We're, we're doing it on Fridays. Um, okay. And it would be, are you Central Time? I am. So it would be 1130 Central Time. So okay. How's that possible? Yeah, anything's possible. Come on, sure. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if it's lunchtime, it's lunchtime. Ah, we'll we'll eat. We you mind us eating on a hangout? We'll just, yeah. You know, dinner and the show. So let's think about that. <laughs> okay, we're we're talking about fairness. We're keeping it kind of just like personal stories about fairness first. Um, it would be great to have your kids in there too. Um, That'd be cool. Great, Chris. Any last thoughts as we go ahead? Well, um, I guess, you know, from a youth voices perspective, Paul, I like that, um, you know, that this umbrella topic that you have, fairness, works with a lot of my kids' inquiry, and I think it uh, links a lot of Joe's uh, students' inquiry in Oakland, and so I think, you know... And Sean's, I think, too. Right, right, yeah, definitely Sean's, and I think, so sometimes in the past, I think the big questions we didn't always latch into, um, but I think this one has a lot of possibility... Um, so I'm feeling good about you know. And those those texts up there on that page are just suggestions. You know, mm -hmm. if there's another way to connect, that'd be great. But yeah. 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 Gail, how can you? How can we keep uh, connecting with you? <laughs> well, I fortunately have you fed right into my Gmail every time you have an offering on yeah. TTT okay. or EdTech Talk. So um, I'm going to hear from you. And this good. this one made me stay up. Actually, I was in bed reading, and I got the email reminder, and I said, oh, i got to get up. So the passion of the topic, the importance of it for our world, is what brought me here. Super. Sean, last thoughts? Uh, I am currently thinking how much I wish that I had kids at 1230. Uh, <laughs> but you, can you get like a... Two or three kids to kind of do an extra service, <laughs> to kind of something. Leave your other classes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean I do. Uh, you know, to convince the teacher. Yeah. Uh, I'll yeah. Take I mean, that troublemaker. I can. Uh, <laughs> I can. I can look into it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I I agree with Chris that the the fairness angle uh, helps to to really capture. I think at the heart of one what, what my kids are researching and two. What I think teenage is, is has always been something mm. I've noticed as something that's on the that's heart true. of teenagers is is this issue of fairness, uh, at all different levels, uh, mm -hmm. from societal to what happens with the way they they deal with their parents and everything in between. I think that they, they are that is a forefront topic in their mind. So, and and let me encourage you since you're brand new with us, to, don't don't you know have your kids post their questions like one paragraph. Here's my question. You know, get get up right away. Okay. Uh, I, I remind myself that too. But. I thank you all. Um, we're here every Wednesday at uh, edtechtalk.com slash ttt. Um, we are a broadcast of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo set up. Thank you for this conversation, guys. Talk to Good you night. soon. Yep. Good night. Good night.